in the day. We're going to bless this icon this morning. But I, I have a story to tell first. And so you're going to have to wait a little while because. You want to come up close? Speak yeah, up, I think this is. Speak up, okay. This is an important story. Uh, this is St. Rita, and today is her feast day. St. Rita of Cassia. She's from Italy. An Italian. And for the previous seven years, she has been hiding in plain sight over on the wall over there where there's a blank now because she's here. And she's my patron. And I want to say a little bit about her and how I came to know her. In 1984, I had passed all of the requirements that were necessary for me to be ordained in the Episcopal Church. And at the very last minute, my bishop decided not to ordain me. I'm not going to go into that story today, mm -hmm. uh, but I think there were political reasons behind it within the context of what was going on in the Episcopal Church at that time. And when that happened, I was absolutely devastated. And my mom uh, came to understand just how awful that experience was for me, and she had inherited a little bit of money from one of her aunts, and so she gave me that money so that I could make a trip, uh, uh, a pilgrimage, and I went to Israel and Jerusalem, I went to Rome, and I went to Canterbury on that trip. I was gone for about three and a half months. And when I was in Rome, I went to a basilica and in one of the alcoves was a statue of St. Rita. And I didn't know anything about her at all, but she is known as the saint of impossible causes. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured at that time when I got to know her that uh, if anybody needed a saint of impossible causes, it was me. <laughs> because I still believed in my heart that I was being called to be a priest. And yet, within the context of the Episcopal Church, that seemed to be absolutely impossible. So now I have to make the comment that everything happens in God's time. Mm. And uh, that feeling I had in my heart was not <coughs> wrong. It's just that I didn't understand the timing very well. So I want to tell you about St. Rita and why she's so important to me. St. Rita, I've got a little bit about her on my smartphone. smartphone. <laughs> um, she's known as the, the patron of impossible causes, of difficult marriages, and of uh, parents of unruly children. <laughs> <laughs> she was All of a sudden, the devotion to St. Rita is going to increase. <laughs> She's been hiding in plain sight for the last seven years, everybody. So she was born in 1381, and she died on May 22nd in 1457. She was beatified by Pope Urban VII in 1627. She was canonized by Pope Leo VIII on May 24th, 1900. In 2000, Pope John Paul II had her body, which is incorrupt, uh, under glass in Cassia, brought to Rome for the celebration of the 100th anniversary of her canonization. So this is her story. Um, when she was born, right after she was baptized, Carmelita um, uh, Lottie, uh, bees came and rested on her mouth. They were white bees, apparently, and this indicated to, and they didn't sting her or anything, and it indicated to her family that um, she had a special purpose uh, that God was going to give her. And however, uh, she wanted to go into a convent. The, uh, there was an Augustinian convent in Cassia, and she wanted to enter it. But instead, her parents married her off 
in an arranged marriage when she was 12 years old oh. to a young man who was the son of one of the two families in Cassia that were at war with one another. Mm -hmm. And apparently they thought that she would be safer and they would be safer if they married, got her married into this family. Well, the young husband was abusive to her physically, psychologically, and she had twins when she was still 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And she lived with this for 18 years until her husband was murdered by, the, uh, by people from the other family. Mm -hmm. And the two boys were teenagers by that point, and they were convinced that um, uh, revenge was the only answer, and they were being influenced by the father's brother, who had a tremendous influence on these two boys. And Rita was extremely upset about this because she felt in her heart that if the boys were involved in a revenge killing because of what had happened to her husband, that they would go to hell. Mm. And so he prayed and prayed, or she prayed and prayed, that they not be allowed to move forward with that act of revenge. And by the end of the year, both of those sons died. Wow. At that point, she really wanted to go into the convent, which she had always wanted to do in the first place. But the nuns at uh, St. Uh, Mary Magdalene, um, which was an Augustinian convent, would not allow her in because there were nuns in the convent who were relatives of the other family. <laughs> um, and so they wouldn't let her come in. And plus, she had been a married woman, and she had had children and so forth. So they wouldn't let her in. And she kept going back, and they kept saying no, and she kept going back, and they kept saying no. And so finally the mother superior told her that if she was able to bring peace between those two families in Cassia, that there was a possibility that she could enter the convent. And so she went to those two families, and over a year's period of time, she was able to bring a peace accord about and they signed it, and they, that piece of paper still exists, mm. where they signed. And after that, she went back and asked again to be allowed to come into the convent. And when she was 36 years old, she was allowed to come into the convent. When she uh, had been in the convent for any number of years, she won, uh, Good Friday, she was praying in front of a picture of Jesus uh, at the crucifixion, and she prayed very fervently that she be able to experience something of the suffering of Christ. Mm -hmm. And something happened, and the story is that from that painting, a thorn somehow lodged in her forehead, which came to be called a stigmata. Mm -hmm. And for the next 15 years until her death, she had a wound on her forehead that would never, never go away. Uh, about four months before her death, she had tuberculosis by that time and was bedridden at, in the convent. People came to her constantly for advice and for help because they knew what she had managed to do for the people of Cassia and alleviating this uh, horrible, fanatical uh, war between these families. And she asked one of uh, the, her friends to go back to her home her family's home, to a garden. It was the middle of the winter, it was January, and bring a rose back to her. And of course, the friend thought, this is nonsense, this is impossible. But she went into the garden, and lo and behold, there was a red rose, one red rose, blooming in the garden, and they brought it back to, to Rita. And four months later, she 
died. She was buried for one reason or another. A few years later, they needed to uh, exhume. exhume her from, from the grave, and they discovered that she was um, incorrupt. Nothing had happened to her body, and so they put her under glass at that time, and that's why she had, it was possible to bring her to Rome a uh, hundred years after she had been canonized. But she's often shown with um, a crucifix in her hand, oftentimes a red rose, sometimes with bees. Um, actually, the Augustinian habit was brown or beige, but she's always shown in a black habit. Mm. And there is a wound on her forehead that you can see. And um, I would just like to close by saying she has been a wonderful patron mm -hmm. uh, to me. And uh, of course, I couldn't believe it when I met Bishop mm -hmm. Peter and, and all of the things unfolded so that I would end up becoming an ordained priest, an ordained Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and last year, it's already a year and a half, uh, in January of last year, I went into um, the hospital, the Kaiser Hospital in Anaheim, and I was put on life support. Um, my sister can tell this story better than I, because she was conscious and I wasn't mm -hmm. when all that was going on. But Sharon has said several times that I died seven times during that. I was on life support for three weeks, and the doctors almost gave up after two weeks, and then they didn't. But my, I was on machines. A machine was keeping my heart going. Machines were keeping my lungs going. Machines were taking care of my kidneys and everything else that was what kept me going. And I came out of that. They never thought I'd walk again. Mm. And I'm walking. And um, she is a saint of impossible causes. <laughs> <laughs> and no cognitive damage. And no cognitive damage, that's true. Uh, which I think surprised, well, surprised uh, a lot of people. It wasn't long after um, Mother Esther and Diane and I had met that we talked about St. Rita, and we both came to the conclusion it was St. Rita's invisible hands that guided Esther and Diane to us. So we thought it only appropriate to have an icon of her patron saint hanging in our church. Apparently, Saint Rita likes our church. <laughs> so now we're going to bless this icon. And uh, year by year, I would ask Bishop Peter if we could get this icon blessed, and year by year, something happened, like he had to go on some mission, or wasn't here, or had a stroke, or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have a book of blessing. There's a blessing in the book up there. Up there. The sacramentary book? Of Jesus? I'm not sure where I just said it on the altar. We have to have the right words. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. Let's get the icon. Oh, the icon. Let us pray. Shall we stand as we pray? Almighty, everlasting God, who did not forbid us to crave or or paint like or carve or to paint likenesses of your saints, in order that wherever we look at them, whenever we look at them with our bodily eyes, we may call to mind their holy lives and resolve to follow their footsteps. May it please you to bless this icon. Oh, I'm one of you. We'll let Mother Esther Diane bless it. May it please you to bless this holy icon, which has
has been made in memory and honor of blessed or Saint Rita, the saint of the impossible causes, and grant to all who in its presence pay devout homage to her, may by her merits and intercession obtain your grace in this life and in the everlasting glory which is yet to come through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now she'll be hanging as a member of our church. <laughs> Thank you.